Let me please turn with me this evening to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Let's pray. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wondrous privilege to come before you and your word. We ask you, Lord, in your kindness and grace to speak tonight, to speak into all of our hearts, to challenge us, Lord, where we are at, as to who is Lord, of our lives. Lord, may you speak into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. May you send your Spirit up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. May you touch my heart and my life. And may you glorify your name. We surrender all things to you for Jesus' sake. To your glory. And God's people say, Amen. The question is this evening what is a Christian? What is a Christian? Well, many people in our world today, in answer to that, will say to you and I that they are Christians because they were born in a Christian home, or they come from a Christian family, or because their parents were Christians, and therefore they also must be Christians. Other people will turn around and say to you and I that, well, my great-grandfather was a minister, or he was a bishop, or he served on the church council, and therefore I must be a, church, a, a Christian. After all, I'm not a Hindu, I'm not an atheist, I'm not an agnostic, I'm not a Buddhist, so I must be a Christian. I've got a Christian heritage. I was even confirmed at one point, and therefore surely that makes me a Christian. Now those are just some of the answers that many people will give you and I today, but the question remains, and that is, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? What does the word Christian actually mean? Well, according to the Bible, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it states there that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in so doing, history tells us that Antioch was the third largest empire in the, uh, city in the Roman Empire. It was a pagan city. It was an immoral city. And yet there were a group of people living there who were called and they were identified as Christians. Which means for you and I tonight that those people were living such a different lifestyle that the whole city of Antioch turned and took notice of them. And so they were labeled and they were identified, to, identified with Jesus Christ because of it. All his people turned and said mockingly, look at those Christ-like ones. Look at the Christ followers meeting over there. Why? Well, because their lives their values, their morals, their behavior, their practice could all be identified with the person of Jesus Christ. As it says in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 concerning the lifestyle of the early Christians, just listen to this. It says that they were a people who devoted themselves, in other words, they were committed to the apostles' teaching. They were absolutely committed to Bible teaching as a group of people. It's something that stood out about their lives and it identified them as a group of people. And to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together. In other words, they were a community. They were seen as a community by others. They had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to everyone as they had need. In other words, they cared for one another as a group. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Wow. And so as people turned and they observed them, they would say, well, there go some Christians. Look at them. There's their lifestyle. Look at them. Look how they're living. They are different. And so we need to ask ourselves today, what makes a person a Christian? Who is a Christian? Well, according to God's word, a Christian is a person who has gone and made a decision concerning Jesus Christ for their lives. 
a decision where one accepts Jesus as one's personal Lord and Savior or the controlling entity for your life. That is a Christian. A deliberate decision in one's life where one acknowledges the right for Jesus Christ to rule and to run one's life. And therefore a deliberate decision to trust Jesus Christ and Christ alone for forgiveness for your sins and your eternal destiny. That is a Christian people. And so in a word we could say today that Christianity is Christ. That is what Christianity is. A decision made concerning Jesus Christ for yours and my own life. Sadly today, though, many people misunderstand this point. They misunderstand what Christianity actually is, despite the fact that Christianity is something that's been around for the last 2,000 years. In fact, there is a lot of confusion these days over the whole issue. There are many conflicting views and opinions. And so what one finds is that very often people will turn around and they will reject Christianity for this reason or for that reason. But when you sit down and you actually talk to them, one finds that they are not rejecting true Bible Christianity. No, no. But instead, they're rejecting something that they think is Christianity, which is nothing more than a counterfeit. Now, in saying that, I'd like to read to you today one of the most concise and clearest statements as to what, in essence, Christianity actually is all about. Look with me at Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul writes there in Philippians 3, verse 7, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of who? Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing who? Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I might gain who? Christ, and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in who? Christ. That righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know who? Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His what sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Now that is quite a statement in that what we notice there is that over ten times Paul makes a reference in that one passage to Jesus Christ. Ten times. And so what he does is that he makes it quite clear to you and I sitting here today in those verses what the essence of Christianity actually is and what it is not. Now as we start off today, I would like to turn and pick up and look at what Christianity is not, firstly. All because, you see, there are so many false views and misconceptions of what true Christianity actually is today. Views that are very often not biblical, and they affect you and I, they affect our perception of Christianity, and they affect how we see ourselves in terms of being a Christian. Three points. And so I'd like to look at the first one, and that is, firstly, Christianity is not merely a creed. It's not merely a creed. It's not merely a summary of orthodox beliefs. Do you know that? Now, of course, Christianity does have its creeds, yes. And it's very important for you and I as people as to what we believe and why we believe those things as we sit before the Lord. But the problem is, is that it is perfectly possible to believe a Christian creed for you and I to be able to sit back and quote it by heart without any reservations in life but still not be a Christian at all. Now, in REACH, South Africa, our church, we from time to time reaffirm our faith in the saying of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, the Maker of heaven and earth, and so on. And we affirm our faith in that creed. Our children, when they're preparing for confirmation classes, they are taught the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. And we also look and touch on the Athanasian Creed. But the point is this, statements of fact do not make you and I as Christians as we sit in this building here today. Oh, somebody says, but just hold on, Mark, I know God's Word. I know what I believe. If somebody is wrong in life about the Bible or Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross, I'm able to show them the right truth. I'm able to quote Scripture. I'm able to take them through the pages of the Bible and show them what is right and wrong. Surely that makes me a Christian. 
Well, the answer to that is no. Not at all. In that that is not Christianity either. In that, you see, being able to quote all the right facts doesn't make one a Christian this evening before God. Listen to what the Apostle James wrote in James chapter 3, verse 19 on this. He said, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons, the devil believes that and they shudder. They shake. In other words, friends, even the devil and all his demons know all the facts and they know all the truths about Christianity and about God and the Trinity. They know the doctrine of God. They know about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They know about the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that He is the Savior of the world. They know all about it. They know Him. They can even quote all the facts, chapter and verse. In fact, think of Satan in Matthew chapter 4 and how he quoted the Bible to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He knew the Scriptures and knew them well. And James writes that they shake when they do so. They literally quake. But you know what? It doesn't make the devil and his demons in a right relationship with God in daily life, does it? In that their orthodox beliefs do not make them Christians. It does not save them. Secondly, Christianity is not merely a code of conduct either. Now I'm saying this, please, once again. Do not misunderstand me. In that a code of conduct is something that is very, very important. It's an important part of being a Christian. All because there are such things as what we call Christian ethics. In that there are certain principles, friends, that literally govern Christian behavior for all of life. Certain ways that a Christian should be living or not living. As our Lord Jesus Christ turned and He said to you and I in Luke chapter 6 verse 44, He said, you will know them by their what? Fruits. And the fruit that He is speaking about here includes righteousness. Now, do you know what righteousness is? Well, it means to live a life that is pleasing to God. It is living a life that is summed up in the Ten Commandments which our Lord Jesus Christ in turn went and summed up in the two greatest commandments for us. Which in Matthew, Mark chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus said, Love God supremely and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so do you want to know what it is to love God supremely? Then read the first four commandments. Do you want to know what it means to love your neighbor as you should? Then read the last six commandments. For they are a definition of love. They're a definition to you and I of righteousness before God. And so if the commandments of God are not reflected in yours and my daily life today, one cannot stand up and call oneself a Christian. That is something that is perfectly true. But you know, in and of itself, a code of conduct is still something that is not enough for us to be saved. And this is something that is shown to you and I throughout our Lord's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, where our Lord Jesus goes out of His way to teach you and I there that one can be upright. One can literally be well-behaved. One can be decent in one's standards of living. But still not be a Christian, not be a child of God, and not get into God's heaven one day. And why? Well, because there are many atheists and agnostics and people who worship other religions out there in the world today who are upright and live lives that are morally good. But that doesn't mean to say that they are Christians and that they will get into the kingdom of God. And so a standard of life then does not necessarily make you and I a Christian. No matter how good that standard is. Thirdly, I need to say to you that in essence, Christianity is not just a matter of ceremonies either. In that when we turn and we stand back and we look at Christianity, friends, we have ceremonies, don't we? We've got baptism, we've got the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion, and both are extremely important in Christian living. Our Lord Jesus Christ was one who went and instituted those for you and I to follow. And so as a Christian church, we have practiced them ever since. But you know that despite it, it is still possible to practice every single religious observance and ceremony within a Christian church and not be a true Christian. Do you know that? 
It's possible to read one's Bible every day. It's possible to pray, to be christened, to have been confirmed by the bishop, and not be a Christian at all. Now, as we conclude these three negatives, I also need to say to you that not only is the essence of Christianity not any of these three, but it isn't all three put together either. And so the question is, what is Christianity? What is Christianity? What is missing from the three things that I have gone and mentioned to you? How on earth can a person be upright How can they be orthodox and religious and know their Bible literally from cover to cover, quoting book after book of the Bible and still not be a Christian? What is the missing key in life concerning Christianity? Well, it's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. In that you see, Christianity is a person. It's not a system of philosophy or a ceremony or creeds or a church tradition or a dominant denominational thinking, although it has all those things in it, and each one of those things might be important to a degree, yes. But Christianity is not that essentially. Instead, true Christianity, friends, uh, our faith is a person. It is a relationship. In that a man or a woman lives in a personal, living relationship with somebody who is called Jesus. And when one lives in that way, then one's theology and ceremony and creeds and ethics all make sense and everything falls into place in life. And so that is the first thing. Christianity is not a creed. It is not a conduct. It is not a ceremony. And it's not Bible or biblical knowledge. It is a relationship in life with Jesus Christ. It is a relationship with Christ. Secondly, we see that a Christian is a person who has gone and made a decision, therefore, concerning Jesus. Not a decision concerning a church, or a decision as to whether one is going to join a certain church or denomination, or whether one is going to serve in a certain function within a church. That's not Christianity. Nor is Christianity a decision to turn over a brand new leaf for 2020 and follow some new orthodox form of belief. No. Instead, folk, True Christianity is a deliberate heart decision made in a person's life concerning nobody else but the person of Christ. It's the person of Christ. And so I need to ask you as you sit here this evening before the eyes of our holy God, have you personally, in your own heart, made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your entire life? In that He controls your thoughts and your feelings and your attitudes and your relationships. Because if you have a relationship with Him, you're a man or a woman here today who has said at some point, Lord Jesus, from this time on, I will live for you. Lord, I will live for you. I live not to please myself, but I live to please you, God. So often in life, we know that statement, we profess that statement, but we still rule our lives. It's what we think, it's what we want. That's not right. I wonder, have you ever gone and made that personal decision, and in so doing, cried out to Jesus, saying, Lord, I want to believe in you. Please give me the faith to trust you and wash away all my sins. Have you ever done that? Has there ever been a personal point in your own life where you have decided for Christ personally in life? The Oxford Dictionary says that a decision means a judgment arrived at after careful thought, which shows itself by prompt and determined action. Which shows itself by prompt and determined action. And that is right. We make many, many decisions in daily life, don't we? From the time that we get up in the morning to the time that we go to bed at night, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? What are we going to do? We're making decisions all the time. Every single day that we live, we go around and we set goals and things that we need to achieve in the day. And this is something that man has gone and done right from the very beginning of creation. 
In that when God went and created Adam and Eve, the very first two human beings in his image, he was one who turned and he said to them, you may eat of all the trees in the garden, except the one that I've placed in the middle of the garden, Adam and Eve. If you eat of that tree, you will die. And then came the tempter, Satan. Now we don't know when Satan entered the garden, but sadly he was a pitfall that Adam and Eve were not spiritually alert to in life. And so they listened to his voice, and they broke God's law, and they sinned. And from their actions, the disease of sin has come into every single generation of man, so that every single one of us sitting here, our friends, our family, the people we love, the people we work with, are sinners by nature according to the Bible. In that by life, we all continually rebel against God. We all seek to live our own lives our own way, with a total disregard for the creator of the universe and his law. And God's penalty for such a life is death. As God's word says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death as well. Now when the Bible speaks of spiritual death, it means hell. It means to leave this world and be completely separated from God for absolute eternity. As it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, that therefore... Just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to what? All men, because all men have sinned. And so Adam and Eve made a terrible decision, one that has landed uh, up bearing spiritually terrible consequences for every single one of us in this building tonight, and our friends, our family, our spouses, our children. Now, when we turn the pages of Scripture, we find many others in life who had to turn and make decisions in life before God as to whether they would have followed the Lord or they would not follow God. Moses, for example, he had to turn and make a decision to either suffer affliction with the people of Israel or to enjoy all the pleasures of the Egyptian court. And he chose the people of God. Never ever dreaming that God would call him to serve him at aged 80 so that he would land up becoming one of the great heroes of the entire Christian faith. Later in scripture we read of Joshua who stood up before all Israel shortly before his own death and he said to them in Joshua 24 verse 15, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers beyond the river, or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will now serve the Lord. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verse 21, we read there of another great prophet who said very much the same thing. The prophet Elijah stood up on Mount Carmel before again all Israel. And he turned and he said to them, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Now you know, I need to say today, there may well be somebody sitting here who needs to make that decision for their own lives. Perhaps you're somebody who for many years has attended a church, but in regards to Jesus, have never ever come to that hard decision for Christ. Never. Maybe you've spoken about Jesus being the Lord of your life, but you rule your life. You decide how things should be. Well, God comes to you today and He says it is time. Stop being double-minded. It's time to stop sitting on the fence of your faith. You need as an individual today to know whom you are going to serve. Whether it is Christ, or yourself. For our Lord Jesus has said in regards to life, we cannot serve two masters. Either we will hate one, or we will love the other. Or we'll hold to one, and we will despise the other. Which means, people, that one cannot serve God today and materialism. You cannot serve God today and your wants. 
You cannot serve God today in your desires. You cannot serve God today in your needs and your grudges. We cannot serve God and ourselves despite what we might actually feel or think. It is either Jesus as Lord absolutely or He is not. For either we will live for ourselves or we will live for God. Such is human nature. But we cannot live for both. Instead, for every single one of us, there comes a time in our life under heaven where we have to stand up and choose how we are going to live the rest of our lives to the glory of God at the prompting of His Spirit. Will we surrender our innermost being and our will and our emotions to God? Or is it self? And so a question. Have you personally made a decision for God as Lord? It's not a case of making Jesus Lord one day of your life. He is Lord of your life. Will we uphold Him as Lord and be obedient to Him and ourselves pushed into the back corner. Well, if you haven't, I'm going to ask you to make that decision today, tonight. For as our Lord Jesus said, there are only two roads in life. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 13. It's about page 52. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to eternal life. And only a few find it. There's the road to heaven, friends, and it's narrow, it's tiny, it's narrow, and the gate there to get through is narrow, it's small. In John chapter 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto God the Father but through me. Now I know that's quite a statement to go and make today, for we live in a world and a country which is a pluralistic society. One where the thinking is all roads lead to God. Through Buddha and through any other faith. It doesn't matter what religious leader you follow or what religious leader you believe in. Well, my dear friends, such a belief as that is a direct contradiction to what Jesus Christ says in Christianity. But Jesus alone says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto God the Father but through me. No one. Jesus is that narrow gate into eternity and into the kingdom of heaven. And so then secondly, in the light of this, we are called upon to make a life-changing decision about Jesus Christ forever. In that we either accept Jesus Christ with all our hearts and commit ourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, Lord of our thoughts, Lord of our feelings, Lord of our insights, Lord of our relationships, Lord of our, our hearts, Knowing that such a decision will affect our friendships, our pleasures. It will affect our relationships, our behavior, our priorities, our choices, our thinking. And over time, it will affect us forever. Or we turn and we reject Him and keep ourselves on the track. Thirdly, if we decide to make the decision for God, what is needed? What is needed? Well, we need to firstly recognize what God has gone and done for you and I. In that we need to acknowledge that God is one who loved you and I so much that He sent His only Son into this world to die upon that cross for you and I. Paying the penalty for our own sin which is death. Taking God's judgment in life for you and I. And this action of Jesus is described for us in the Old Testament. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Look at verse 4. It's about page 874. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 4. Here it is spoken of what Jesus did for us 
hundred years before Jesus came. He says there in Isaiah in verse 4, Surely He took up our infirmities and He carried our sorrows, see that? Yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him and afflicted. But He was pierced for what? Our transgressions, our sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace, peace with God, was upon Him. And by His wounds we have been healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. Such is the first thing we need to recognize. What God has done for us in Jesus. Have we lost that sensitivity if you know Christ? You know, when I sat with that man who was dying in ICU recently, uh, he passed away this last week. He turned around as he lay there, a top director, and he, a, 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 a top businessman, he lay there, and he cried, he wept, and he turned around and he said, I need Jesus. How could he suffer the pain that he suffered for me? He says, the pain that I'm going through in my, in my cancer is agony. He says, but how could he do it for me? And he wept, he wept. We need to realize that. Secondly, we also need to repent of our sins. As our Lord Jesus Christ said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, it's not enough to just say sorry for our sins in life. Instead, with repentance comes the idea of change. Change of mind. Change of attitude about how we view the world and others in life and eternity and God. A change of lifestyle. What is important to you and I and what's not important. And it's absolutely vital for a walk with God. This is why when our Lord Jesus started His ministry, He stood up and He cried out and He said, The time has come, He said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 1.15 When John the Baptist started preaching, He brought to the people a baptism of repentance. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up to preach, he called upon the people of Israel to repent, repent. And so repentance then is a condition we are called upon to meet all of us. In Hebrew, it's teshuvah, it means to turn back to God. But the good news is, is that repentance, according to Peter in Acts chapter 5, is a gift of God to us. Do you know that? Isn't that something wonderful? It's a gift of God to us. Do you know why? Well, because what it means is that if you are somebody here who is battling with sin in your own life, maybe you are somebody here who feels that that sin is just almost on top of you and at times it's almost beyond you. Perhaps your thought patterns, maybe it's a desire, maybe it's your attitudes or whatever, and you just can't seem to stop it no matter how much you cry out and desire. Well, we'll know this. The good news from God is that repentance, turning away from your sin, is not your ability to do. Instead, it is a gift of God given to you, and all you need to do is to cry out and ask God today to give you this gift, and God will give it to you generously. I wonder, friend, have you ever asked God to help you in turning away from your sin? That sin that drags you down, that destroys your relationship with God and your marriage, your business, and who you are. All as you turn and accept God's free gift of salvation to you, and it is free. It's free. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, page 242. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, look at verse 8 and 9. What does God's word tell us there? Paul writes, for it is by grace, that's God's kindness. You have been saved through faith, faith in Jesus. This is not of yourselves. It's what? A gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. And there it is. Have you ever asked God for the free gift of salvation? And then fourthly, 
If you call upon Jesus, then you need as an evidence to profess Him and to live for Him publicly. Publicly. For our Lord Jesus said, Anyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. I wonder as you profess the Christian faith, are you a person today here who publicly acknowledges Jesus before the world as your Lord, your God, and your Saviour? And in so doing, you show it by a changed, obedient life that matches your profession. Because Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Turn to John 14. Look at verse 21. John 14, look at verse 21. Jesus said in verse 21, Whoever has my commands and what? Obeys them. He is the one who what? Loves me. It's obedience. You see, it's not just profession. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Look at verse 23. Jesus replied, If anyone what? Loves me, he will obey my teaching. Look at verse 24. He who does not what? Love me will not obey my teaching. See that? These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. And so I wonder today, is your lifestyle obedient to God? Do you also acknowledge Jesus Christ before the world as your Savior and the Lord of your entire heart? For if you do, Jesus turns and acknowledges you before God the Father who is in heaven. If you don't, well, so what is Christianity? Well, a Christian is a person in whom Jesus Christ lives as Lord. Is that you? Let's pray. I'm asking you today, tonight, to make a decision for Jesus. Or not. To either recommit yourself to Him this day and to ask the Lord to be the Lord of one's entire life. Your thoughts, your feelings, your decisions, your commitments, your forgiveness, your relationships. Or to come to Him this day and not. Perhaps it's coming to the Lord for the first time in your life. But don't leave it. For your eternity depends on it. Perhaps there's something you want to say to the Lord privately this evening. Perhaps deep down one has never ever made a commitment to Christ. Despite our smile or on the outside. Won't you just pray this prayer then quietly with me if that's you. Heavenly Father, I confess that I'm a sinner. I've lived my life my way. I'm sorry and I repent of my sin. Thank you for sending Christ to die in my place. Please forgive me as you have promised. Please give me your gift of eternal life. I want to live for you from today on. Help me by your Holy Spirit. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. 
God's people say?